This is May the 2nd, 1967, and uh, Raymond Fields and I, Guy Ross, are talking today with Mr. Tom uh, Crystal. And uh, Mr. Crystal, you started in the mail service and uh, early, and why don't we start right there, and you relate your experiences in the mail service. Well, I, I started carrying the mail in, in 1980, and I, had, I got the appointment uh, in October. At what age, Tom? At, uh, I wasn't quite 18 years of age yet. I was near 18, and I was 17. So I, I began. I became uh, uh, 18 on January the 20th of the next year. See, that was a fairly young age to be starting, wasn't it? Uh, yes. That require a special. Uh, uh, concession on the part of the government, or were they taking them below 21 at that time? Uh, they were taking them that way. And uh, we, uh, I carried the first two years horseback. And of course, I had a, a saddle slicker that covered the mail pouch and me, and, and I went tear down over my shoes so that I had no danger of getting wet. And uh, I used to uh, always rode good horses, and I would trade horses on the route, and, and or uh, uh, buy cattle, and uh, they used me for veterinarian. I'd even they'd, uh, drive up to a mailbox or ride up to it, and there'd be uh, four or five bulls tied out to the mailbox, and I'd say, "You want to sell them? No, I want you to castrate them." And I always carried a castrating knife with me. And uh, I'd, they'd have a wash pan and full of water and soap and towels, and I'd wash my hands and get in, get get on my way. They pay you for castrating? Oh no, they give me the meat. I took the meat. It was very very delicious meat. I don't, a lot of people don't think so, but I thought it was fine. Oh, that was my premium. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and uh, finally after I. Carried the mail about two years of horseback. I, I carried in a buggy and a cart, and uh, the roads were so bad at that time. And uh, when I came to what bridges, few bridges there was, I, I'd unhitch my horse, ride him around the bridge. Before we get away from your horseback days uh, at lunch today, you related an incident of coming across a new settler with his team of mules and oh, yeah, four that. children and his wife and the covered wagon. Yeah, that's right. We, uh, uh, one time when I was riding a horseback, uh, you know, the roads were not worked and they were washed and full of rocks of jump ups at least a foot high. I run on, ran on to a, a, a fellow in a covered wagon and driving a little team of mules and he had his wife and four children that I saw in the wagon, and he couldn't get up this hill. And I said, uh, I, uh, you got a rope, I'll pull you up there. He said, what do you mean, pull me up you? I said, I'll tie you on the saddle horn. Oh, he said, don't think you can do that. I said, you got a rope, and I'll show you. So he got a rope, the first one he gave me, I broke it, but we doubled it the next time, and I pulled that wagon, team, family, and the whole business up that hill on that horse. It had a horse a rough shot all the way around, and he just squat and pull just like an old pulling horse. What was its weight? He weighed about a thousand pounds. Wasn't a heavy draft horse then? Yes. Oh, he he but he was stout built horse. And that cow, that fellow uh, driving that team had big high boots on you on a big hat, and I suppose he knew something about uh, what horses could do. But he was he was amazed. He said he never saw anything like that in his life. <laughs> and, so, Excuse that interruption, I'll go on to your bridges. That's Well, uh, uh, as I told you before, I, I pulled the buggy across by hand and then hitched, drove the horse around. And uh, then I uh, uh, went on my way. Uh, one time, uh, you know, the, the, those road overs here didn't believe in building a bridge on, across the stream because they said if you ever built one across it, you always have to build a road. You always have to have a bridge there. But I drove into the stream one night after uh, it had been up, and the front wheel dropped into a, a ditch that had been washed there during the rain, and I turned the buggy and myself and all over right over on top of the horse. We all got out without getting hurt, but it broke the shaft out of the buggy. 
And this happened the road over here right lived right there, and he had a blacksmith shop, and he t uh, fix, took the shafts and worked them over, sent me on my way. And uh, well, it must have presented quite a problem to you getting across the uh, creeks and rivers, whatever there was, if they didn't. Oh, well, it was. It was a problem. What'd you do when the water got up? We just wouldn't go. Just didn't go. Uh huh. And uh, sometimes there's a way to go around those streams, maybe. Uh, maybe there'd be a bridge the next mile down and I'd go around it. But all us tried to go, and I had seven hours and a half when I carried with the horse to make the route, 26 mile route. Where, 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 incidentally, you might say where the territory that you covered was? Uh, my, <coughs> my route covered. Uh, uh, Did you start at good night? <coughs> started at good night, which is in Logan County, and it c covered part of Payne and uh, Lincoln County. I was right in the corner of those three counties there, and uh, which naturally we we couldn't get any work done. Uh, there was few, just a few votes down there. And they, those days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they they worked the roads, roads were built by votes were by they? votes and if you didn't have any votes you didn't get any road <laughs> but one time uh, uh, one of the over road overseers you see they didn't have any graders those days they just uh, would plow them in and, and then drag them down the best they could and uh, one over road overseer had worked uh, about a half a mile of road and of course he was out the mailbox wanting me to brag on it and I want to know what I thought of it, and I said, well, that's fine. I said, it ought to do 50 years. And uh, he said, 50 years? I said, yeah, that's, been, that's the first time I've been working 50 years. <laughs> 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 it was. They just didn't work. I mean, they didn't, uh, if they just got so bad, the ruts got so deep that they couldn't get over, and they just took a plow and plowed it in. And then you just, it'd be a little rough for a while, but it finally get all right. So. You mean they just plowed dirt over in the gullies? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, did they drag it with a... With something? Uh, sometimes it didn't, sometimes it didn't. I, uh, didn't have any road maintainers. Oh, no more road maintainers. And of course, they always had those old slips, they call them, that they fill in places with, but they used those just where you, places you couldn't get across. And maybe the next time the rain came along, it washed it out again. And uh, it, was, it was a problem from start to finish. And, when I finally got to where I carried the automobile, I, the roads were just terrible. And uh, those mud holes in bad places, uh, I'd put the car in low, or the old Model T in low, you know, or Model A, and just hit those just going just as fast as I could go, and just, so I'd bounce out on the other side. <laughs> and uh, the, the car, windshield all be covered in mud, you couldn't see where you were. And sometimes I'd have to get out and wipe it off. I'd always carry me, and I always carried a shovel. Sometimes shovel <coughs> sand. Yeah, and, and shovel that. I've had the mud roll up under your fenders so the wheels wouldn't turn. Oh, old, gum, old black, old red gumbo. No just, gravel of any kind on the road? Oh, no, just roll up. No, no gravel. We didn't know anything about gravel those days, you know. <laughs> <They'd>, <laughs> some places that... They'd haul big rocks and throw them places to keep it from, so you get across, but there was no gravel. And you just bounce across it when you got there, you know. So, and, and I used to have to trade cars every year when I was going in a car. It'd just be a wreck the time the year was over with. Did you and, still have the same amount of territory to cover in a car that you had? Same, yeah. On the horse, did, uh -huh. were you able to do it quite a bit? Oh yes, I did. Last time, uh, I'd make it about two hours. Good. What and, about when the weather was bad? Oh, sometimes I wouldn't make it. I, 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 <laughs> I'd get out in those where those roads are bad, and it got so it worried me more all the time. You know, I'd, I'd get to rain at night and I'd think, well, how am I going to make it tomorrow, and all that stuff. I got. A, I remember one time, you know, I used to carry their. They'd send, have me bring out their chewing tobacco and smoking tobacco. And they just have to have it. One woman came out to the mailbox one day and said, "You bring John some chewing tobacco tomorrow." And I said, "Okay." 
said, but don't forget it. said, you know, he gets mean when he hasn't got his tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, were you the, the delivery boy and the messenger and everything oh, for all kinds yeah, of stuff? I uh, settled their family troubles and and uh, they all, they came out and all of them tell me about fussing with their husbands, you know, or some uh, girl not doing right or uh, something like that. And I'd have to pacify them some way or other, like, one old, I had, uh, when I first started carrying the mail, I had two families out there that were old slaves. And uh, some of the families still out there, the boys. And uh, an old woman came out and told me about her, how mean her boy I was. And I, I'd pass by, I'd say, now listen, you wouldn't trade that boy off for uh, any of those other boys around the country, would you? I said, he's a good boy. Well, maybe so. Anyhow, she went over later on to, and complained to a, a white family that lived there. She was a Negro, and uh, they sided in with her. And her boy, she went back and told her boy what had happened, that the white folks knew what he was doing. And uh, that fellow went berserk and shot his mother and went over and shot this woman and shot the bo man, husband of this woman in the arm. And uh, I went out there with the doctor that night after, and saw the whole what had happened. And uh, one fellow was plowing, uh, telling me about plowing cotton down by this where they found this Julius. This Julius got shot in the deal. This fellow got a Winchester, one of those old things you had to put the shell in, you know, and all that. He ran him upstairs and he shot through a tube of six and hit this fellow in the chest. Was this, this the man that had gone berserk? Yeah, and the fellow hollered, Lord, my time has come. And he, went, he was lying out in the yard, and this fellow thought he was dead, you know, and he wanted to run out of the house, and this fellow turned around and took another shot at him. But anyhow, they found that fellow dead that night off in a draw, and I was over there when the sheriff and all of them looked for They didn't find him that night. They found him the next morning. And... Uh, one of the neighbors was telling me about plowing cotton down there. He said, our son got about down. He said, I drove uh, my mule up to the end of the row, and he said, he snorted. He said, you know, there's ghosts. It's smell old Julius the ghost there. He said, <laughs> <laughs> said you know, they can smell a ghost. He said, I, I just unhitched right there and went home. do <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> What uh, type of car did you favor on your routes when you started using automobiles? Well, I, 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 favor, I drove Fords all the time. I got started with Fords and never used anything else. I don't know. Model so, T? Model T and the Model A and so on all the way through. And uh, uh, Tom, your father homesteaded there, did he not? Yes. In what year? Uh, he 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 bought the homesteader out, see, which then uh, and the fellow relinquished his claim. My dad came in and in, in March the fourth, in eighteen ninety four. Well, that country was pretty well infested with outlaws at that time, wasn't it? Oh, uh, we used to see them go by uh, from this uh, place north of us. They'd go see them ride by there. Of course, we didn't know who they were, but uh, all figured they were outlaws, and I guess they were. And we had, uh, those days had oxen, oxen that they used to break their sod with, you know. And they uh, had an old one-armed man that drove those oxen. And he was a professional cuss word man. He, he knew all the cuss words that, uh, that you could imagine. I used to go with him to water his oxen. Was he wasn't kid. the one from Mary, was he? The no. <laughs> <laughs> this is old man Culver. You see, uh, 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 He'd drive uh, those, those oxen, uh, get in about a quarter of a mile out of water, they'd smell it. They'd just break, you couldn't stop them, you couldn't head them off or anything after they smelled that water. They'd just run over you. And, uh, uh, of course, I had, uh, I never knew that till I uh, had the experience of watching that team. Did these outlaws ever give your father any trouble? Oh, no, he, he was friendly to all those fellows, he had to be. There wasn't no, uh, wasn't no use falling out with them. Huh? And uh, they all turned out to be pretty good citizens, all but this one fellow. And uh, he left there and went to Muskogee and turned out to be quite an auctioneer. I don't know what reputation he had down there. 
but uh, you know uh, uh, when we first uh, we used to get our mail at Cimarron City that was north of the river when it first came there they came in by stage and uh, uh, finally they had a little store down on the south side of the river and, uh, and an old Irishman that lived down there he used to go and get it the mail and bring it over to the store and let the farmers come and get it but I forgot one thing about carrying the mail. This old Irishman was a substitute before I started carrying the mail. He carried it horseback, but he didn't use any saddle in the wintertime. He said it was warmer that way. He said it didn't <laughs> he extend the cold better if he didn't ride off. On, on this 26 miles, Tom, in the three counties, Logan, Lincoln, and Payne, how many mailboxes did you have, approximately? Uh, well, around 50. Around 50. Did you ever sell any newspaper subscriptions out there? Oh, yeah. When I first started carrying the mail, that's one thing I forgot to tell you. Uh, only, uh, we didn't have any parcel posts, and uh, we had one daily paper, and that was, one fellow took the Gussie Daily Leader. And uh, after I carried quite a while, uh, Raymond Field became editor and owner of the Gussie Daily Leader, and he made a, a long depression and couldn't get much for the papers anyhow, and he made a deal that, uh, so that uh, I got everybody on my mail route taking a, a, the Gussie Dale leader. And of course that helped a lot too because uh, they were interested in me making a route and they'd get out, they'd come out and wait for me with the, have their shovel and be digging off the rough places and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you quite, ever do any trading, uh, eggs, chickens, uh, hogs? Oh, I, yeah, a fellow came out to the mailbox one day and said, the cows are getting my turkeys. He said, this is going to clean me out, it looks like. And uh, he had a bunch of young turkeys, dandy turkeys, and I said, well, I'll buy them. He said, and I, he said, I'll sell them. And I said, what do you want for them? And he told me, I said, Just, if you deliver them over there to my hog pen, I was feeding about 200 head of hogs that time. And I, Live them over there, well, I'll just pay you for them. And he said, well, I'll deliver them over there. And, and uh, of course, the turkeys just got as fat as they could be, uh, eating corn as the hogs and eating grasshoppers and the alfalfa field and all that. And at Christmas time, uh, some of them turkeys weighed 24 pounds, them young turkeys. Mm -hmm. Well, easy. Tom, you tried to be a father advisor to those poor people living out there in the backwoods, did you not? Oh, yeah, they come to me with all their troubles, and I had to, had to tell them something, you know, the best I could. And they all believed in me and had faith in me and were nice to me, every one of them. How long did you carry the mail on that same route? Uh, let's see, it figures 37 years, I believe. 37 30, years. See, it began in 1908 and, and retired in 45. Didn't you tell us the other day about uh, some fella lifting a car? Oh, yeah, car that a Model A. One time I uh, rode, it had been raining a lot, and I decided to straddle a rut. I was afraid I, uh, so bad I couldn't go in the old rut. And the uh, outside wheel bogged down, and there I was. And this old boy come along, and I, I said, say, can you get your team to pull me out of this place? And he said, I'll just lift you back in there. He backed up to that car and just set it back up in the road. <laughs> How big was he? Oh, way about 250. <laughs> as big as a stout as a bull. <laughs> well, was uh, were these outlaws that were in that territory? Were they people who had been outlaw, who had, uh, you know, done things against the law other places and had come there to uh, most homestead of, or something? Most of them were cowboys, uh, herded cattle in uh, that country, and uh, and there were some outlaws. Now this fellow that my dad bought out, he. Uh, Went to Perkins and they had saloons those days. And he wasn't he after he was in Perkins a while he killed a man. And uh, they were uh, or some of them turned out to be good citizens and some of them were not. Well, did did they have any trouble with the law around there? Oh no, much. They uh, stayed clear of the law. This uh, outlaw, everyone knew what he was doing. <coughs> uh, the one north of us. But they they couldn't get anything on him. Well, what what was he doing? Well, they, they knew he was harboring outlaws and their horses, and uh, 
and uh, I don't know what all they were doing, really. I was just a kid, you know. I just don't know what all they were doing, but they were uh, sure doing that. In his early day, wasn't Dr. Holbrook a sort of a country uh, circuit riding doctor out of Perkins? Oh yeah, I mean, we had a we had one doctor in Goodnight one time. He rode horseback. And then we had a, another doctor in Perkins, named Anderson. Doc Sexton was the one who lived in Goodnight. And Dr. Anderson uh, lived in Perkins. He carried he he well, served. Would his you patients. report illnesses in the fa in certain families to them? Uh, and need oh, for treatment? Uh, oh, yes. Uh huh. And uh, when I was six years old, I had my leg broken, right close to the hip. And uh, doctors were just, well, my, I had a neighbor that rode, I think, half the night. He got some old country doctor that came there to set my leg. And uh, we had some lath that was, uh, you know, it's a lath and plaster house those days instead of putting sheetrock on it. And uh, he took some of those old lads and, and um, told my mother, said, get some bed sheets, and he tore the inscription off and put those uh, laths on the leg and wrapped it with this bed sheet, and I got plumb all right. There's nothing wrong with it. We didn't have any x-rays or anything <laughs> like that. Now, I think there's one interesting period that you mentioned, and... Uh, uh, I think we ought to record it. Uh, during the, after the Wall Street crash in 1929, uh, the day of depression wasn't very far behind, was it? No, it wasn't. Prices tumbled, cotton wasn't worth anything, they had buy bail movements and so on and so yeah. forth. Uh, <clears throat> these folks had to resort to some method of providing for the families, did they not? Yes, they should. Out there in the hills. Yeah. And it became quite a section for a, a moonshine, yeah. moonshining liquor. I had 13 moonshiners on my ride one time. Had a 50. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you were very confidential. You didn't consider that you were an officer of the law. No, I was. I was the, the federal enforcement officers would try to find out me who was making whiskey, and I'd just say, "Well, I don't know." They, they. Uh, I just carry their mail. That's their only method of making a living, was it not? Sure, they were. They were. They were. They were people are desperate out there. They the corn was worthless, practically. I bought corn, put in my crib for, for twenty cents a bushel. What That's, would that corn be worth today? Oh, about a dollar and a half, dollar seven, dollar seventy-five. I don't know what the market is on corn right now. So they just converted it into moonshine liquor. Uh, one time, a corn was only worth a dime a bushel. Cotton was two dollars a hundred. I well, remember. People come out there and get it. Or they had they had they sell the stuff. Well, nobody, no one around there bought corn on us uh, that needed to feed to something. See, and they fed hogs, and then they'd, they they uh, uh, like. Uh, and earlier, before the railroad went through there, the railroad went through there in 1898. Up until that time, they hauled all their stuff to Guthrie. Uh, even the cotton, they had an old cotton gin out in the south, out in the Black Jacks there, that uh, bale of cotton, and then the farmers would put about two bales of cotton on a wagon and drive over to Guthrie and, and sell it and bring home a load of groceries. And my dad used to, when he, besides bringing home our groceries, he'd, uh, there'd be a groceryman there that, that uh, needed groceries, and he'd haul a load of groceries home to this grocery store. And my dad only, uh, I guess everybody else was the same way. They didn't pay their grocery bill or anything only once a year. I remember uh, my dad used to run a grocery bill as much as $1,000, you know. Just, and uh, he'd pay it in the fall and start off charging things for another year. People didn't pay. Uh, people were trusted those days more so than they are now. And uh, what were the principal markets for the uh, moonshine whiskey? Well, uh, the, out of those towns, uh, different towns. Guthrie. Guthrie and Cushing. Stillwater, Cushing. Cushing. Yeah, and uh, there was an oil boom day too. Yeah, there. that and the oil boom over Cushing. They used to buy the, all the, a lot of liquor over there. there was, now, who did they sell the liquor to? Did they sell it to? Just the individuals, or the saloons, or well, what? No, there was no saloons that moonshine days. See, they sold to individuals, 
And uh, those oil field uh, drillers those days, uh, old, road, old cable tool drillers and all that, uh, like a huge drilling company uh, out of Bristol, they, uh, I don't know whether they ought to mention their name or not, but they'd buy 10, a 10 gallon keg of whiskey, maybe they'd have 50 gallon of whiskey in, the, in their basement. Hmm. And uh, they'd give big parties. Uh, this Hughes told me whenever he run out of, uh, out of contracts, he'd give a big party. Give everybody all they wanted to eat and all they wanted to drink, and then just sat there and the telephone would ring all day, the next day giving him contracts to drill wells. <laughs> I guess that's pretty good psychology. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way they don't do that anymore. That's advertising. Yeah. 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 There must be, I, I wonder if there are any uh, interesting incidents you know about the enforcement officers as they try to track down these moonshiners. Oh, well, I, uh, no one but the federal tried to. They uh, seemed like the local officers didn't. Uh, they were looking for votes, and there's so many people implicated in the liquor business that uh, they just didn't pay any attention to them. I don't think they charged them anything for operating. They just, uh, some of them, they knew they had to make a living. They just didn't know they were there. Yeah, they didn't know it. And if they, and some of them were, uh, if the federal was going to raid them, they'd better not tell the local officers that they, the, the, the man would find out they was coming out there some way or other. I don't know why. <laughs> Did, were there very many federal officers around there? Or they just come in once in a while? Oh, they just come in once in a while. There was no local. There was all out of Oklahoma City or some place like yeah. that. Yeah. Did they did they find very many of the stills? Oh, they'd find one once in a while. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't see how those people hid those stills out. Looks like they could just look up and see the smoke or something and find them. Well, that, that is one trouble in the early day, but uh, the smoke. I used to go along a mill route and I'd see a curl of smoke coming out of the draw over there. I knew what was going on, but. Uh, uh, it was a dead giveaway, but uh, they uh, they finally got to using those gasoline burners, you know, in later days, and they couldn't, they didn't put out any smoke. Oh, I didn't know that. You mentioned earlier, one of you, about the Sooners. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Boomers. And Boomers. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, they had, uh, they, those Sooners, of course, those were the fellows that settled all that country in where we were, Sooners. And, uh, I bought a farm down by Perkins that, that showed on the abstract. The old man told me that that uh, he was a sooner. And by that you mean he went across before the yeah, before he April twenty second, eighteen eighty nine. Yeah, and uh, he got a little afraid, and he his daughter became twenty one years of age, and he all he had to do was go over to Guthrie and relinquish his claim, and then his daughter filed on it, and it showed on the abstract where his daughter owned it for a few years till she could prove up on it. When you prove up, you don't pay any taxes on those old homesteads that they ran in and got that time until you prove up. You paid a dollar a year, I believe it was, till you proved up on them and then it became property of yours. And uh, we had, uh, in our uh, 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 title, it shows that we got a, a patent signed by President McKinley. And at that time, we just paid one dollar a year tax up until we got this patent. Well, now, what would have happened to some of those Sooners if uh, someone would have found out? If would it just been a matter of proving that they had gotten the land illegally? Well, uh, some of them knew it really, but it, maybe it wasn't safe to go and complain about it. I don't know. They didn't do it. <laughs> Nobody ever did that. No, like that it, lead poisoning. It, what, what, what are you going? Yeah. What are you going to do when they have a, a eight or ten men? Neighbors are going to say, "Well, I saw him on there first, running there first, See, and you couldn't, and you'd have to have maybe one man to say, "I know he didn't." The neighbors always sided with the guy. Uh, they all hung together on those. Were they sooners too? Usually. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah, they were all sooners. Well, now what was a boomer? Well, I don't really know. A boomer was uh, an organized group, particularly under Captain Payne, that came in in groups and settled uh, principally in Payne County around Stillwater and in there, and contended they had a right to uh, usurp this land and farm it. 
And uh, I believe, if my history is correct, that uh, federal troops removed Payne and his boomers three different times, but they would reorganize and come back in and uh, farm the land, raise their cattle just like an ordinary citizen. They had no title to the land, but they were trying to get the United States government to open this acreage, these seven counties in central Oklahoma, to settlement, the homestead settlement. That was their principal campaign. <clears throat> See, uh, where we, uh, our homestead, that country was opened in 91, and across the river just north of us, well, it was in 89. The, uh, this uh, country where we are uh, settled was the Iowa country, Iowa Indians. And there's still some of those Iowa Indians there. Well, now, when did good night start? After the railroad came in 1898. And uh, the good night became a uh, pretty good little town. It had a bank and it had a drugstore and two grocery stores and a dance hall and uh, a saloon. No, just a saloon out in the brush is all they they do. <laughs> yeah. They that that see up until statehood or after statehood, wasn't it? They would ship. That's when they could ship whiskey in from from. Uh, other states by mail order. You'd After statehood, mm -hmm. they could. And uh, people used to order their whiskey from Kansas City mostly. Hmm. And uh, but they couldn't sell it. And they wasn't supposed to. Yeah. They did though, but they wasn't. Well, supposed. where exactly was Good Night? Probably ought to say that. Well, it's a. It's a It joins Payne County. Payne County is on the east of it. And it's, uh, you don't know what section it is in? Yeah, I guess if you know that, I didn't well, know. Well, it, it, it's in section, uh, let's see, it's section 12, let's see, section 12, 13, yeah, in section 12, uh, uh, 16 one east, uh, 17 one east. What happened to the town? It doesn't exist any longer, does it? No, they uh, they they banned the railroad for one reason, and uh, then uh, uh, the bigger town just took over, uh, just like they have everywhere else, and they transferred this route that I had. A fellow named McCarty carried it after I did, uh, carried it, and he they transferred him to Perkins. He's still carrying the mail out of Perkins. Uh, when did Perkins start? It, it started in 1889. Did it start before? It's in Payne County. In Payne County. Was it's on the north side counties. of the river, see? It, it, it was, all that country was settled at the same time as Stillwater and all that up in there. Was. Did it uh, start bef did, before the railroad came in? Oh, yes, it? yeah. 18, you see, the railroad didn't go through until 98. Santa Fe Railroad? Yes. Between between Cushion and, and Guthrie. Didn't you witness the first train come through there uh, then? Yes, we all went down to, we heard, we found out that the train was coming in. It just uh, didn't go all the way through, but it came to Goodnight and then backed up. Uh, down there, and the first train came in there. Was it a pretty festive occasion? Oh, yeah, people were there. You know, in early days, a uh, long time after the railroad was, was uh, run through there, people would go, didn't have much to do those days, but like in town of Perkins, you'd see uh, they had uh, an evening, Sunday evening, why there'd be maybe 50 people, it was a mile, Perkins a mile from the depot, they'd walk down there to see the train come through. <laughs> and uh, I, I've seen them do it. Uh, they had uh, two passenger trains each way and a freight train each way every day, and they did a lot of business. But, uh, uh, Tom, uh, uh, there were people by the hundreds who had never seen a railway, weren't they? Oh, yes, uh-huh. Yeah, there was a... Uh, when the railway at Okima came through Okima, the Fort Smith and Western, they would uh, lay a rail, and this flag-bedecked teapot, as we call them, would move up to that rail, and the superintendent of the Fort Smith and Western 
from Parks from uh, Fort Smith was driving it and a huge crowd had gathered around and he uh, leaned out of his cab window and said hey you folks out there look out I'm going to turn her around and they just scattered like quail <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, they, uh, we, had, we used to have hobos, you know, and hobos traveled the railroad those days to the highways. And, uh, they, uh, it was very common, uh, my mother used to feed them. And for some reason or other, they'd walk right by other houses and come right straight to my mother's house. She'd feed every bow that came along there. Hmm. And, uh, uh, once, once in a while, I'd run on to one down on the railroad bridge, uh, cooking his breakfast. A cold morning, and they'd uh, have a, a chunk of bait, bacon, and they'd slice it off and put it in, cook it in water. They'd just build them a fire and set a can on the water, get some water out of the creek there, running water there. Put this bacon in there and cook it in this in that water. That's the way they lived, right? And they lived under the railroad track at night under the bridges. One once uh, morning we looked down and we had a shack down and we had, everybody raised cotton. We had at a certain time of year we had help lived in those shacks. We saw the smoke rolling out of one of those shacks and went down there. And there's two old Irishmen, typical hobos. They saw said they saw this house there and then came over and investigated and there was a stove and they thought they'd just rest and clean up a little and they'd they'd wash their clothes and and uh, had them hanging on the line and and just living like the life of Riley right there. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the town uh, south across the river from Perkins? Vinco. Vinco, it was a rail point, wasn't it? Yeah, well, no, they all called it Perkins, but they, they tried to take over. They had a little fight in between the two towns there. Their people formed another, tried to established another town down on close to depot but they never did any good perkins finally overcame the whole thing was there a competition to get the railroad to come through perkins or good night in the first place yeah they uh uh to get the right of way there was really that's they were going to come through there i guess all right but they'd go out and tell the farmers that if you want this railroad you better sign up and uh, we'll run this railroad right down through here. I know my, and my father's place, uh, I don't know whether they did this on purpose, but they surveyed it right down through the middle of the place. Well, he told them that uh, he'd give them the right of way. Uh, he wouldn't give them any trouble if they'd move over to the north edge, so they moved it over there. Do you own that homestead now? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 didn't you know this? fellow with Pistol Pete Eaton. Oh, yeah. He lived around there. Very somewhere. well, very well, yes. I knew him. I'd known him for years. I knew him when he first, when I was just a kid, uh, he ran a steam engine for, for a trash machine around there. At one time, he, when he first came there, he named, went by the name of Good, Goodhue. He lived with some people by the name of Goodhue. And he owned uh, somewhere or another, he got a hold of a farm out there by Perkins. And they talked him into buying a thrash machine and finally lost that farm. But he went barefooted all uh, up until we organized the Old Settlers Union, Reunion deal out there. And one of my neighbors bought him a pair of boots. <laughs> and that's the first uh, pair of shoes or boots I ever knew him to have. How old a fellow, how old was he by the time he started wearing boots? Well, uh, I imagine that was in about 1915 or no, later than that. He went barefooted later than that, didn't he? You saw him over there in my 20s, I guess. 20s. Right? Mm -hmm. Also wore, wore his hair braided yeah. constantly. And uh, he's the guy that the, that's the mascot at OSU. Yeah. Yes. He'd, he'd uh, light his pipe. He'd just take, pull his foot up and drag that match across the sole of his foot and just like, crack like it was on cement, you know. My and uh, he w he'd wear rubber boots when it rained because the water would crack his feet. See, he couldn't afford to let them get wet. The and, water would crack his feet? Yeah. It, it, it was so hard on yeah. the soles. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it's hard and thick. And he used to get in. Uh, now this sounds, don't uh, you wouldn't believe it. He would. Uh, He'd walk around on that top of that boiler, and their feet would just sizzle and stink, you know, barefooted. On top of a boiler? Yeah. And, uh, Thrasher boiler. Oh, on a thrash machine engine, you see. And uh, I had a, a brother-in-law came to see me from California. I was telling him about Frank. He'd take, he ran a blacksmith shop finally there. Raymond had been in his shop many times. And he'd pick up a piece of red hot iron between his toes and throw it over in a slack tub. Well, my brother told, my brother-in-law said, "Why well, you can't tell me that stuff?" I said, "I'll tell you. I'll take you down there and show you." Old Frank was a good friend of mine. He'd, he liked you'd do anything for you, you know. And we sat around there a while, and I said, "Frank, I've been telling my brother-in-law about you picking up that red hot iron and throwing it in a slack tub, pick it up your toes." And I said, "He thinks I'm lying." Oh, Frank said, "We'll just show him." So he sticks the iron in the in the furnace there and gets it red hot and and lays it on the anvil, cuts it off, and falls down in and picks it up, but picks it up and throws it over in the slack tub. But before he did that, before he when he's heating this iron, his brother-in-law said, "Let's get out of here. Don't have him do that." <laughs> I said, "That don't hurt him a bit. He just does it every day." How did he do that? Uh, he didn't, I guess, maybe he didn't have any feeling in his feet or something. What, what would you How say? How many children did he have, Tom? He had several children, and they were very bright. Uh, he gave them all a college education. All a college know? education. and Although the, he had never attended grade school or high school or college. No. He gave he, all of his family, uh, children. He could, he could write a fairly good hand, but he couldn't spell very good. And uh, he, had, he had a wonderful memory. He could tell you stories and... And he read different cowboy books, I think, and memorized them so that, and get up and tell them that he had that experience himself. He could recite the classics, and the favorite was, uh, his favorite was The Lady of the Lake, the staggered he would drank his fill. <laughs> he, he'd play the violin and uh, sing, and... Uh, uh, early day, we used to we'd have any well trouble in a while. We'd go to town and get Frank to come out to fix it, and he'd come out. If it took a week, he'd come out. And he'd, he'd stay stay right with us. See, never go back. He he'd quit his blacksmith shop or anything, and come out there and stay with us and and visit a friend of ours, George Ridpath. Uh, George was an old timer there, you know, and he'd every evening he'd escort George's and and have a little music. And he'd cross his leg and he'd hit that toe against the floor, you know, bling, bling, you know, just like a polyote's foot. <laughs> and play the violin and just, and tell stories and have the best time anybody you ever saw. Where did he get the name Pistol Pete? Oh, I don't know exactly where he got it. He, he supposed uh, uh, his father was murdered by a group of uh, outlaws. And he is supposed to have traced these men uh, all over the nation, all okay. over the continent. As a matter of fact, he killed one of them in Mexico. And uh, he killed all of them. There were seven of them in revenge for his father's death. Hmm. And he was a crack, he was a kind of a gunman, wasn't he? Yes, one time uh, uh, we, he was working in a well out home there, and I said, Frank, we're going to have to take a little time out here. Get a chicken for dinner. He said, pull me up. And he got him up on top, and and he said, which one do you want? And he had his pistol with him, of course. He left it, didn't take it down the well. He had to lay it on top. I said, that big red rooster over there, and he just shot his head off just like that, you know. <laughs> oh, he was uh, he was cross-eyed. You couldn't tell which way he was looking, but he knew which way he was going to <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, I can't tell. Uh... He must have been quite a character. I can't oh, see what would make that, be so there, there unusual. There been, uh, have been books written on him. Oh, he he was some. a character. Now, there's no, they never find anybody like him to travel the world over. You remember, Raymond, the time I took him over to, what, a rodeo club over to Guthrie? Mm -hmm. or and he got up and made a talk. And, and, uh, I asked him to recite The Lady of the Lake. Yeah. And he uh, put on a show for him and Told them that he had uh, 11 notches, was it, on his mm -hmm. pistol? And that don't include niggers, Mexicans, or Indians. <laughs> and uh, after the 
uh, it's all over. Why, uh, Raymond told them uh, anyone that wanted to interview Frank would be welcome, and they just crowded around him and beat anything you ever saw. Had he ever had any trouble with the law? No. Only uh, he had some trouble with the outlaws. They were afraid of him. Uh, he carried a Winchester to work every morning and a pistol on his side. I don't know why nobody paid attention to him. Some, well, he was just as a piece. And he made his own badge out of metal. He took a, cut something of metal out of something and, and took something and stamped his initials and name in the, on this piece of metal. He wore that as his badge. Did he work quite a bit as a lawman? Or? Well, they'd call on him once in a while, like bank robbers. They, they, one time they robbed the Meridian Bank down there, and they called up that they were coming towards Perkins, and they got down there and shot a hole through the radiator of the car and stopped them down at Vinco, a little town south of there. And they, uh, they tell how, and I don't doubt it, they were going to rob the Perkins Bank. When the Perkins Bank has never been robbed. All the banks around there have all been robbed. Perkins Bank has never been robbed. They said that one time they came in there to rob the bank, and they saw Frank coming down the street carrying his Winchester and, and a pistol strapped on him, so they decided it was bad medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, at this bank at Meridian, uh, it's quite a noted case, one hold up. The, the family lived above the bank, two-story frame building, and uh, Mrs. Heath, her husband, ran the bank, and Mrs. Heath uh, took a shotgun and killed one of the outlaws on the outside of the bank when mm. they came out. Mm. Well, I, I wonder if there's anything else we ought to cover on this before we... So the bank of Carney, they was robbed one time, and the banker, they put in pursuit of the old boys, and, and they... Uh, uh, if I'm right, I don't know. I think I am. One of them jumped out of the car and waited for this banker and somebody else to come along. They shot, shot them and shot this banker's eye out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, George Jonas. Mm -hmm. I know him real well. I know he's got one eye. I think this has been a most interesting interview. Do you not, Guy? Yeah, I sure do. It's a very good one. Uh, anything else before we wrap it up oh, I don't to put on here I don't think of anything else right now uh, well, there's we, a lot of things though that uh, we better not tell I think <laughs> <laughs> well we sure do thank you uh, This is Penn Woods. I'm interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends Library. Today is December 4th, 1969. We're in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, and I'm visiting with Mrs. Warren Darner, D-A-R-N-E-R, -E who is the farmer Betty Wood Menifee, M-E-N-I-F-E-E, -E, who incidentally has been in Sepulpa since 1893 and is the... Uh, has lived in Sepulpa longer than any other citizen of this city. 
Mrs. Darner, uh, I wonder if you could tell me something about your uh, your birth and your early childhood, if you would. I was born in uh, Holt County, Missouri, up in the northwestern corner of Missouri, and uh, my grandparents had moved to Tulsa, and uh, we came down to Tulsa to visit them. And my brother, Newell Menifee, was taken ill. And uh, my father, who was a telegraph operator at the time in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, came over because of my brother's illness, and it, and it required a long stay here. So uh, he became interested in, in the railroad. He came down on a hand car from Tulsa to Sepulpa and uh, decided that it would be a good place for a store. He had never done any, been in the mercantile business before, but he decided to do that. So when my brother was well enough, we went back to our home in, in Missouri, and he built a store on what is now Main Street in Sepulpa. And we came back in, um, about the, came to Sepulpa the 1st of September of the, after he had finished the building, and that was in 1893. And uh, we have, it's been my home ever since. My parents and my brother and I made up the family. What was your age at the time you came here? Oh, well, let me see. I was born in 85, and we came in, I was eight years old. I wonder if you could describe Sepulpa at the time that you came here in 1893. Well, this was the end of the railroad, the terminus, and uh, the Frisco. The, uh, the, most of the buildings were over on the north side of the track, and later they, uh, the south side was, the, was where most of the building was, and that's where my father built his store. There was a hotel on um, south of Maine, old uh, Smith Hotel, W.A. Smith, who was a Civil War veteran, and uh, he had this hotel. And I don't know how long it had been here when we came, but uh, he and his wife and three or four boys and a married daughter lived here. The daughter was um, Hattie Smith McCallop, and she lived uh, across the uh, tracks over on the north side. Her husband was managing a store. The only mercantile store that was in Sepulpa at that time was Hall's, and it was um, opposite the depot which was on the south side of the Frisco track, but that was over on the north side. And Mr. McCallop, Albertine McCallop, a full blood Creek Indian, was managing the store for Mr. Hall. Could you tell about uh, transportation and the roads and streets at that time here? Well, we didn't have any streets. They were just trails. And uh, of course, there was, um, people rode horseback more than any other way. Of course, they had wagons and buggies and uh, a few good good horses in here. I know my father had a team of horses that was supposed to be very fine horses, and uh, we could drive over to Tulsa and ford the, Rock, the uh, Arkansas River and get over there in oh, a little over half an hour with a team, and that was awfully good traveling. Few people could make it in that time. Could you tell something about the relationship, the size of Tulsa and Sepulpa at that time? Well, Tulsans, many Tulsans say that uh, they were smaller than Sepulpa at one time, but uh, that's a mistake. There never was a time when Sepulpa was as large as Tulsa. They always were ahead of us. They had, uh, oh, there were several stores in Tulsa when we came here, and there were, my father built his store. 
uh, the second store, I think, in town, and uh, I mean mercantile store. Now there was drug, there was a drug store here. Had been a drug store here before we came, but I believe the man had uh, closed the drug store and it was being used as a residence at the time we came. Does this store still exist either in itself or as a, as a, is there a successor to that store here? To my father? Yes. No, we have, uh, there's no, no uh, connection with any How of the store. How long did that store? Oh, me, let me see. I can't say when they, when they uh, closed out. Oh, huh? Is the building still here? No, it's, uh, the building is where, um, Folsom's feed store is. Is that, uh, is that, uh, Folsom or is it, does he own it or does, uh, Taylor, Gus Taylor own it? Gus Taylor. Gus Taylor owns it. Well, it's on the corner of Hobson and Main. It's as near, that's the nearest location I can give because the streets have been, have been changed and it isn't exactly the spot, but it's, that's in that location. Then after, after we had been here a while, a um, man named Owen wanted to build a hotel across the street and down a little ways from us. And uh, he asked my father if he would furnish groceries for the workmen while they were building. And my father told him yes. So he built um, onto another building that he had put up a frame building. He built, built a stone built a front to it and by the time he had finished it he couldn't pay for the groceries that the uh, laborers had uh, bought from my father so he said I can't do anything about it I just like to turn it over to you and so he gave it to my father in exchange for what he owed him and uh, then we moved from the back of our store we had had four rooms on the back of the store building where we lived, and uh, we moved from there over into the hotel, and my mother ran the hotel, and we called it the Gladstone Hotel, which was later the Ripley Hotel, and I, I think it had another name later on, but I don't know what it was then. Could you tell a little about uh, life in Sapapa at that time, thinking in terms of uh, social life or the entertainment that you had it in these uh, before 1900? Well, let me see. There were um, there were families moving in all the time. When we first came, I think there were only four or five uh, families uh, living here, and uh, but they they began to move in soon after we came here. There were a good many others coming in, and uh, they. Uh, they were mostly young people. I thought of them as older people, but I know now that they were uh, were quite young people. Most of them with very small children, or none. And uh, they uh, there was horseback riding, and there were picnics, and there was uh, parties. Our uh, when we uh, my, my father built our first home, it was a little five room house. But we'd have a party, and they'd move the furniture out in the yard, and <laughs> so there'd be and make benches around in the house for so people could sit down in there, you know. And we uh, had uh, there were lots of things going on all the time. There was uh, it was uh, a lot of fun. They had a great deal of fun, and the uh, the uh, schools they started to the school. There was a livery barn built right across the street from my father's store, and they had a little office room. I think they said it was 8 by 12, just a little corner of that, uh, of that livery barn. And uh, uh, Cassie Meadows, who lived in, um, in Kellyville, came over and uh, wanted to start a subscription school. And that was the only place she could find, so they put it in that office. And uh, the children paid, we paid five cents a day or a dollar a month for uh, tuition. And she had, uh, I think in that school, there were about 12 or 14 children 
that's the way I remember it. I can't say for sure the, the number. And uh, it was, uh, it only operated a very short time. Then, um, then there was another young woman came here and went around to the stores and got all the wooden boxes that the uh, groceries and dry goods came in and built her a little, a little uh, one room downstairs and an upstairs room. And she slept in, her up, in the upstairs room and used the lower part for a living room and school. And she had a little school where uh, on the corner of um, Water and, no, Park and Hobson is now. And uh, they, uh, the school children were often called in to help out at these different functions. And the teachers would have little programs that they could give for the, uh, for parties and things. I remember we used to have. And the, uh, one of the teachers, one of those first teachers, said that she, when she came and asked to teach, she said she was well qualified because she had passed the fourth grade. <laughs> there, most all of us were, uh, most all of the school children were beginners. But uh, I had been, my father and mother had taught us kids at home. We had, uh, we knew how to read and write before we ever went to school at all because they had taught us. And it wasn't long after um, after that that the uh, Presbyterian National Educational <coughs> Association, or whatever they call it, um, arranged to build a boarding school for Indians out here. And we had the Uchi Indian Mission, and they uh, that was really a big thing for Sepulpa because uh, they had a good many employees out there and well in the first place the men who um, built the building there was a, quite a crew of carpenters came and they built the buildings uh, they built up four i think four buildings to start with and uh, those buildings uh, stood and were occupied by the indians for years of course there were others added to it but um, in the how long has it been since the city took over that? 20 years. 20 years? Well, about 20 years ago then, they, uh, they closed the Indian school and the city took over that property and now our high school is built on it and several of the school buildings are on it. Yours is the oldest family uh, tie, still tied to Sapapa. Uh, could you tell us about some of the other families, some of the other older families tied to Sapapa that came in the in the early years? Well, <clears throat> as far as I know, the uh, W.A. Smith, the old Dad Smith, who had the hotel across the street from my father's store, or on the opposite side of the street, um, they were here. I believe before any anyone else that I knew. I, I'm just not sure about that, but I think of them being here the first. And then um, there was a family of, uh, and in that family, there were four sons, Wit and Fred and Frank and Marsh, Marshall. And Marshall just died here in our hospital over the last three years or so? I would guess about three years ago. And he had been living in California for a good while. But uh, he, they have, uh, some of that family are still living. His sister, Mrs. McCallop, died uh, a good many years ago, but she has uh, children who, who uh, live near here and they own property here and come back frequently. Then um, the Halls, who owned the store that Mr. McCallop managed, never lived in Sepulpa, I think, or not after we came here, at least. The um, Egans came not long after we did. That was John Egan. His brother was in Tulsa. And um, Jim, 
was the one that was in Tulsa. Jim was selling groceries for uh, St. Louis House. It wasn't groceries. He was selling dry goods, I believe, for a St. Louis uh, wholesale house. And he used to call on my father, and he wanted to go into business with my father. But uh, at that time, my father didn't want a partner, so he didn't uh, didn't take him on. He said, well, now, if you don't let me in on your store, I'll set up a store of my own. My father said, well, that's just fine. We'll, it'll help the town if we have another store. So Mr. Jim Egan had a brother, John, who lived up in Iowa, and he brought his brother down here and set him up in the store just right next to, to my father's store. And um, they were a fine family. We uh, were always very good friends. They had a daughter just about my age and one younger. And then while they, after they came here, their son was born, Sterlegan, who has been a city officer here for many years. Then um, the Adams family were um, were here. Well, one of the son was here when um, we came, but his father and mother and and another brother and a sister moved here later. They, uh, Tom Adams was a was the first Frisco agent here, I believe, and he married a part Indian girl, and uh, lived not far from the depot over on the north side for until she was drowned. And then another brother came and took uh, the station as agent for the station. That was, um, what was his name? Well, I can't say it. Later, at any rate, he was, became a businessman here in town and had an abstract office. And uh, he reared the family here, but they've all moved away. There's none of the Adams family in this section of the country, I think, now at all. Then um, the Whitemans, uh, Whiteman was a, a cattleman, and he had uh, his wife and two children moved in here not so very long after we did, and he, uh, he was later, I think, killed by an Indian. I was just telling Virginia, his daughter called me last Sunday from uh, Pier City, Missouri. And I hadn't seen or heard of her for years. She was, she's a little younger than I am, but we had a nice visit. She says that none of their family is left except her. And uh, what other family? The Williams family was um, came in. Oh, I don't know. Just I don't know about when, but I would say in seven, eighteen ninety. 1897, I would guess they came, and there was that was a fine family. Their father was a butcher here, and the, the uh, brothers were were. Uh, I guess they helped their father in the store. I don't know. I don't know what they what they did, but uh, they the family. Some of them are still in Tulsa. Mrs. Colstead from over was uh, the youngest daughter. She was over to see me yesterday, and uh, we had a nice visit. But they were always very close friends of ours. What would you say were the most important events uh, in Tulsa, I mean in Sapapa, or in this part of the state uh, during the period prior to 1900? What, what, uh, what events in, in, in this part of the state would you say are most memorable? Well, when we came here in September of 93, there was a string of wagons going through here all the time. And my brother and I thought it was great fun. We'd, when they'd, they'd always stop to get water and come into the store. And when they'd stop, we'd say, where are you going? And we knew better than they did that they were going to the strip when the strip was being opened. I don't know just exactly when the strip was opened, but that fall, I guess. And everybody seemed to be going to the strip. And we, that was the talk at that time, as I remember most of it, more than anything else. Then um, the, um, the Indian school was a, was a thing of great importance here. And uh, the surveyors came in, the government surveyors came in 
after uh, they were here after we moved into the hotel because I remember those men staying at the hotel and there was a crew of I would say 25 men possibly and uh, they were from all parts of the United States and some foreign countries and they were a motley crew they were they were a fine bunch of men but they were very different in type and we found them I found them very interesting in their their language uh, they, some of them who were foreigners uh, were just fascinated me with their different pronunciations then um, we had uh, the uh, old Wills we always called him uh, Uncle Tommy Wills was an old man quite an old man from uh, Romney, West Virginia, who came in and opened a store. And his nephews, he was a widower. He was a Civil War, in a Civil War officer and in the Southern Army. And um, his, he had several uh, nephews that he brought here. And they opened up a store. And the, the, these nephews ran it for a while. Among them was Hal Miller, H.C. Miller, and uh, Tom and uh, Charlie Wills and um, Charlie Powell, who later opened up a hardware store, and uh, well, I don't know, they, there were a good many of them. Then um, Mr. Adams, no, Mr. Uh, Land and Mr. Gregory, who were Indians. Uh, I, I can't say they're. I can't say Mr. Land's name, and I know it so well, but Henry Land, yes, and uh, Ira Gregory uh, were interested in, edu edu in schools. They were interested in educating Indians more particularly, but they uh, eventually decided to build um, what they called Dewey College. It was just a public school that, uh, I say public school, it was a subscription school. We paid tuition to go to it. And that's what that picture that I had there is. And that was built up on uh, North um, Linden Street, to the 200 block, I guess, on North Linden. And I noticed in this picture, there are 80, I think 84 children in the, attending the school. And that was in, I believe, in 98. When did you begin to get roads in, uh, I mean streets, in the city of Sepulpa? You said it was lanes when you came here. Yes, uh, trails. Well, I, uh, after the uh, surveyors had uh, had uh, surveyed the uh, street, uh, the, that was a national surveying crew, and they, after they surveyed it, we knew then where the town could be put, and the... Uh, now, my father had um, had asked the Indian agency in Muskogee if, uh, for some land over here to build his store on. And they told him he could have whatever he needed. And he took about a block on Main Street, what is now Main. And it was later, we used part of it, and then he sold off a great deal of it. And that, that Main Street was left for a long while as Maine. But every time the surveyors came along after that, they changed the streets. They, they laid out a little town at that time. And uh, now uh, the streets are oh, maybe uh, 50 or 100 feet from where they were first laid out, the errors in the survey. But uh, the... Uh, Main trails from here went into the uh, into the uh, creek bottoms where the walnut logs were. They brought walnut logs in here that uh, in the 1890s, that was the main business, I guess. And uh, the, uh, they brought in enormous walnut logs and they were shipped to Germany. We got them back in World War One. They uh, made their gun stocks out of those walnuts. 
Can you think of any other events uh, prior to 1900 that are particularly memorable? You mentioned the Cherokee Strip. Well, um, when I believe it was when the um, city was organized, when they first uh, organized the uh, Sepulpa as a, we don't say organized, what is the word? Incorporated. Do you, incorporated. Right. I believe that, well, I think that was in possibly 98 or 99. They had a big, a big celebration here, and they had um, big speakers. I think um, Robert uh, Owen, Senator Owen, was one of the speakers, and they uh, had uh, floats, and oh, I was not at home at that time. I, uh, I didn't see it, but I remember uh, they, one of the teachers here had was uh, going to be married to this uh, Hall Miller, and she was quite a beautiful girl, and uh, they elected her queen of the of the uh, carnival or whatever they called it, uh, celebration at any rate. And she, uh, he, Hall sent to um, St. Louis and had uh, royal robes for uh, the occasion. I know she had on. Um, she had a big velvet with long train and gold trim on it, and it was really a very, very attractive thing. I have seen. I have seen the uh, costume, but I didn't see it at the time of the of the uh, affair. That was a that was a big thing. The uh, merchants and everybody took part. Everybody had a part in that. It seems. We had a bad fire on Main Street. By the time it was built up, uh, oh, three blocks, I expect, um, maybe four blocks from the uh, Frisco tracks on down, they, uh, the, the fire broke out in there, and they had uh, a lot of buildings destroyed. My uh, mother was trying to help with the Buckets Brigade, and uh, she was drawing water as fast as she could out of a cistern that we had and a, and a well. We had both a cistern and a well. And the, there was a man here who uh, sold liquor, some sort of homebrew or homemade liquor. Was, I don't know just what it was, but they called it cat hop. And this fellow sold it, and so the people all called him cat hop. And Mama said he was working just as hard as he, as he could. And she says, now, Mr. Cathop, if you'll come back here, I'll try to keep you in water. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody thought it was awfully funny that she <laughs> called him Mr. Cathop. <laughs> but she said she thought that was his name. She didn't know any different. Well, um, there were lots of funny things that uh, came up. I... Uh, I can't think now of I can't think of anything right now that uh, oh well yes uh, those the outlaws that were in here I think the outlaw story has been done too much of uh, but uh, we my mother raised uh, what they called black Lang Shang chickens at that time and they were fine chickens and she was very proud of them and uh, one day uh, Cherokee Bill and Bill Cook rode into town, and uh, Bill Cook said, just look at those chickens. And uh, Cherokee Bill just pulled out his, um, yes, Cherokee Bill pulled out his gun and shot one of them, just shot its head off. My mother had red hair, and uh, I think I have it confused. It was, uh, it was um, Bill Cook who shot the chicken, and Cherokee Bill said, my. Why don't you run that by again since we corrected it? Start uh, start in again on the chicken. Oh, you corrected? <laughs> That's all right. Well, um, Cherokee Bill and Bill Cook were famous outlaws in here, and they came in town one day riding and talking very loud. And as they rode up the street, they passed our um, place where my mother's Langshang chicken, black Langshang chickens were. And Bill Cook took a pot shot at him and killed one, knocked the shot its head off. 
and the uh, and Cherokee Bill said, uh, "Well, you better leave those chickens alone. I'd rather have all the United States police." Uh, not, they didn't call them police. Marshals. Marshals. All the United States Marshals after me than that red-headed woman. <laughs> and everybody teased my mother a lot about that. <laughs> but uh, they, one, of the, one of the outlaws got off and, and picked up the chicken and took it into the store, and, and uh, we had chicken for dinner that night. <laughs> Can you think of any other funny instances? Well, when we came in, the night we came in here, it was a bright moonlight night. And everyone in Tulsa had tried to discourage us in coming here. They wanted us to locate in Tulsa. And my father wanted us to live here. And my brother was, he'd been away from my father for a little while, and he wanted to stay here with my father. And he said, uh, well, it doesn't have houses, but it's got lots of land. I like Sepulpa. <laughs> We've always, uh, we've always uh, remembered that uh, thing that he said. I don't think of any. I can't think of anything. Do you think else. of anything else? Nothing funny, but most of the houses were already tents, weren't they? Were what? They were very tents, weren't the houses very tents? No, no, they were mostly. Um, my father built a, um, uh, had a lumber yard down on Rock Creek. Just down, just was a little way. Uh huh. Had sawmill. That's what it was instead of a lumber yard. He had a sawmill down there, and uh, they um, they would just cut down logs, and you and he sold uh, sold the lumber, and they people would build their houses. I don't. I can't remember, but very few people who ever lived in tents after they came in here, but. Uh, so, uh, this lumber was full of um, bed bugs. Uh, we our our house was built of uh, of lumber. It was shipped in here, and it had no bed bugs in it. Everybody else had bed bugs. Some of the most immaculate housekeepers, but their house was just oh alive with bed bugs. And Mom would say, "Well, she didn't have any," and they couldn't believe it. They thought she did. You know, you just go into most any house and ride along on the. Uh, on the uh, boards, you could see them, you know. They, they, uh, they said bats carried them to the to the lumber. I don't know how or why, but I know it was a terrible curse here. They, everyone had trouble with it. I'm going to switch to the other side and.